seeing here? Fish. <laughs> this is not rocket science, this is fish. Well, we are at step number 18 of this 21 step ladder. So these sockeye salmon that you see here, they have come up now 18 feet above zero tide. And they are shocked right now. The reason that they're shocked is that they have gone very quickly from salt water to fresh water. This is not a natural system, you know. They came up, salt water, salt water, salt water, boom, they're in fresh water. They're really feeling the shock of that transition and they need a little bit of time to relax, hang out, acclimate. So this step that you see here, step 18, is a really long step compared to all the rest of them. It's like five, six times longer. And it gives these salmon the opportunity for them to do exactly what you see here. They're just resting. They're swimming up, as you see, and then a lot of them are coasting back, and they swim up, and they coast back. They'll do this as long as they need to, to acclimate to the fresh water, and then there's only three more steps to go. They're into the ship canal, and off they go into Lake Washington. But realize, you know, this is June, early June. These salmon are not going to spawn until September, October, November. They're going to go up into Lake Washington. They're going to settle down into the bottom of that lake. They're going to swim around and around in that lake for the next three, four, five months. And you know what? They left their food supply out there in the ocean. That's why they went out there, because there's all that food. There's nothing for them to eat in Lake Washington. They are going to now spend the rest of their life without any food. So they're going to have to draw out of their system the rich oil and some of the protein that they brought with them to get here. And if they run out of uh, food, if they run out of energy before they get back, well, that's too bad. You know, they've committed themselves. It's either spawn now or die trying. There's no going back to the ocean. So these salmon are now going to conclude their life cycle. And they have come already a long way. Some of these sockeye salmon, they've been way up in the Gulf of Alaska. They've been out off the coast of Japan. They've been down around the border of Washington, Oregon. They've been swimming out there around and around for the last three years, feeding constantly on little tiny shrimp. And that's why I like to eat a sockeye, you know, because they've spent their whole life eating shrimp. You know, anything that eats shrimp their whole life got to taste pretty good, right? Well, sockeye is one of my favorite salmon, but these are the top three right here. So, the sockeye go up into the lake. Now, we've got to wait until the water cools down and the rains begin. And then, in the fall, these salmon, in huge waves of males and females, are going to move into the spawning grounds. And the females are leading the way. They're smelling the water. You know, the salmon got here and they know where they're going because they are imprinted on the smell of their home stream. So they're going to go right back to where they were born. But this isn't going to be a picnic. I mean, there's going to be a battle. I, I often think of the females battling it out, kind of like sail day at Nordstrom's, you know? I mean, there's some pushing and shoving going on because the females want the best spawning area. And as that female establishes her territory, and starts to build the nest, and she uses that big broad tail that she has to turn her body on the side, slapping the stream bed, kicking the rocks away. When that happens, here come the males and full spawning regalia. They don't look anything like we see here. This is their ocean phase still. When a sockeye salmon gets to the spawning grounds, the males have a big hook snout called a kite. They've got sharp teeth. Their bodies have now changed to red and their heads are green and those males get around that female and they battle it out for the right to that female. And the male who wins, he sidles over next to that female and guys, it's like the same old story. You may think you're hot, but she's got to or you're not, drive on. You know, she's gonna choose the mate that she wants, but she will uh, usually choose a big dominant male. The spawning process then begins with that male and female side by side right over that first nest that she's done. The male quivers his body against the flank of the female, the signal for her to start dropping the eggs. 
As she does so, the male spreads the sperm into the water. Protected by that gravel lift that the female has dug, that milk settles down into the bottom of that basin. The eggs are dropping right through it. They're becoming fertile now. They're heavy and sticky. They cling to the rocks. But a female salmon, you know, she's learned one of the great lessons of life. You don't put all your eggs in one basket. She will build now a second nest, a third, a fourth, always positioning those nests a little bit farther upstream. There's an important reason for that. When she kicks the gravel upstream, where does it have to go? Right down over those eggs below. By the time she has spawned out, she will have covered up all of those nests with four to six inches of rock, some relative safety for those eggs to begin to germinate because you know what? After that, the ones that have survived this trek and not eaten by a predator, well, it's the end of the show. They are going to go belly up and die. Some of them can live for a couple of hours, a couple of days, but every one of these salmon that you see here is going to perish. They've used up all of that energy out of their system. They can't go back to the ocean. And you know what? As that salmon starts to die, or whether it passes through a larger animal and that waste matter gets spread out, it's the very death of those salmon. I know how you feel, pal, but it ain't gonna get any better as you get older. <laughs> the very death of those salmon that is the most important part of the salmon biology. Think about this for a moment. When a salmon is heading out to the ocean, and we've got a few juvenile salmon in here, but look how big they are. You know, they're like this. They're only weighing three, four, five ounces. Now you see the sockeye. After they've been out there in this rich ocean environment, coming back, the sockeye aren't a big salmon, but that's three, four, five pounds of ocean food. In other words, salmon leave this sterile environment. They go out into the rich environment of the ocean. They harvest all of these ocean nutrients and becomes encased in their body. Ladies and gentlemen, what we see now is this amazing conveyor belt that has connected the ocean to the fresh water. And here on this conveyor belt, here comes all of these salmon bringing back to these freshwater systems tons and tons of two of the most vital nutrients for life, nitrogen and phosphorus. And it's all getting spread out all the way through these freshwater ecosystems. The large animals are taking it up, and you know, in some waterways in Alaska and British Columbia in Russia, we're talking about two species of bear, Eagles, osprey, coyotes, wolves, raccoons, otters, weasels. In other words, the megafauna, the big guys, they depend upon salmon. But it filters right down into the microscopic level. And that's important because down the road, about three, four months, when these salmon bodies are rotted away, the adults are forgotten, these gravel beds, they're alive with young salmon wiggling out of the gravel and they need food. And the first food they find, well, it happens to be the larvae of aquatic insects that are linked in a chain right back here to those parents that died three, four months before. Salmon adults feed their babies. They just do it in a more complex relationship than what we are familiar with. And it's going to go on now. We've got the next year where this young salmon is going to be in the freshwater feeding, but it's also food for other birds and fish. At a year of age, these salmon that you see right here, they've gone through a remarkable physiological transformation and they've changed themselves to a saltwater fish. And now they're heading to the ocean. Plopping in these bays out here, they're going to be feeding harbor seals. They'll spend about a week or two in Puget Sound and then off they go to the ocean. And out in the ocean, in this several thousand mile trek through the northern Pacific, as these salmon feed, also realize that they are an integral part of the food supply for tuna and sharks and mackerel and the great northwest icon. What are we talking about? The orca, right, the killer whale. Totaled up, in some of these waterways, we have somewhere between 100 to 160 species whose very lives depend upon what you see right here. The return of salmon, the death of salmon, the rotting away 
of wild Pacific salmon. They are jump-starting the whole freshwater system. Something that takes place not just in Puget Sound. It starts in, southern, in central California with the Merced, the Sacramento River, up the coast of California, the Great Klamath River, and all the salmon runs that used to be in the Klamath, all the way up through Oregon, through Washington, into Idaho, through the Snake River system and the Columbia River. Salmon country goes right to the foothills of the Rocky Mountains, all the way through British Columbia. You should see a map of salmon rivers in BC. It just covers the whole province. All the way through Alaska, around the corner into Russia, down into Asia. Salmon country. And for those waterways to be healthy and fully integrated with all of these species, you need what we see right here. This is the common component. This is the keystone species that holds the architecture of all of this life together. So you are looking at one of the grand spectacles of biology, and you know, there's something else that's going on here. There's a great story that these salmon are trying to teach human beings about the truth of this planet. Well, for me, that truth is pretty evident. Folks, we're all in this together. You know? We're all connected. Connected to every life form, every bit of the air, the rocks, the inanimate objects. We're all in it together in relationship on this living planet. So when you see healthy salmon runs, well, what does it tell you? It tells you healthy kids. You know? And when you see salmon runs disappearing, and we're seeing salmon runs disappear, well, what does that tell us? It tells us something else. Those of you that came with me from the visitor center, thank you so much for sharing this hour with me. And those of you, this is a wonderful audience, thank you so much for sharing this time with me. And I hope you enjoy this National Historic Site. Thank you very much.